Let your hands use me this day, however you see fit to your Lord. Let it be your word that goes forth today, not the word of man. And I pray that you and you alone are seen and glorified in this place in Jesus' name. Amen. Please, Lord, you may be seated. God is doing some tremendous things in our midst. I do want to share some of the testimonies that have come in this week. I want to invite you once again, I know Brother Jamie mentioned earlier, but this Saturday we have our family fun day at the YMCA. It's a great time of fellowship and an opportunity for us to, to get to know uh, some, some family, friends, people that you may invite just to, to love them and be the hands and feet of Jesus. So I want to invite you to come out and be a part of that day. Whether you've got kids or not, it's, it's fun for the whole family. Uh, I do ask that you bring a covered dish and dessert. Drink, bring double, because we want to make sure that whatever guests come that may not know to bring something, that there's plenty to go around, the church is going to buy hamburgers and hot dogs and cook all that. And with Easter being next Sunday, invite somebody. Make it a personal goal that I'm, I'm going to bring at least one person with me. Everybody in here knows somebody that needs to know God. Make it your goal to have somebody with you. Real quick, I'm going to share these testimonies. There's a family in here that they've been praying for their cousin for the last five years. Been on this prayer and fasting list. And they let me know about five weeks ago, I think. And do the math, we're in our fifth week of prayer and fasting now. But this man's father passed, I believe it was. They've been praying for this young man for over five years. His father passes, and God can take something that it you thought was bad and make something good out of it. And so since then, not only has this fellow been in church, but he's got his mother going to church, his whole his wife, their nephews. Uh, I think one of them or some of them already seen in the church. And so they've been going every week for these last five weeks as God began to deal with their heart. Five years that they've been praying and fasting for him. There was a, a brother in here that had an unexpected miracle, well, I guess a lot of miracles are unexpected, but had a financial debt, a bill that was coming due, and he really just didn't have any way to take care of it, and rather than stressing his past, I just, I don't know, I couldn't do anything about it, so he said, I just said, God is yours. And he said, I got a notice in the mail, said that it was paid in full, he said, somebody paid my bill, and I don't even know how, I know how God did sister in here that received a major pay increase this last week. Uh, this brother I had shared his testimony a couple weeks back about how he was with this, I guess, a temp agency or something like that. They weren't able to hire him on right away. And so they went ahead and gave him a raise because they couldn't hire him on and then gave him a raise. You, just, you don't hear about that with the temp agency. It just is what it is. Gave him a raise, told him the only way they'd be able to hire him is for this other position, and they were going to go ahead and start training him on that, which would give him another raise. And then he got noticed this past week that they're, they're going ahead and, and they've uh, opened up a position or whatever where they're going to be able to hire him. So this will be three raises in about two, maybe three weeks. I've never in all my life known somebody that's got three pay increases in a couple of weeks like that. God be the Lord. These, These are really awesome. awesome. Uh, our, 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 our youth, our teenagers, teenagers. Let, me let me just brag on that ministry for a moment. We, we, we bring, bring our little kids, kids up here and show them all for you. And, and our teens, we would, but they, they, don't, they, they don't want to come, come up here and be seen. seen. You know, you, you get, get a certain age and you're too cool, cool for that. But we've got an awesome youth ministry, and, and, and our youth workers are top notch. They love these kids. They went to Shabbat Youth Conference this past weekend, so if you didn't, see them or you notice that there wasn't as many teenagers last Sunday, it's because they were in church somewhere else. And God's done some wonderful things to that. They came back on fire. You can go look at some of the pictures they put on social media or Facebook this last week of just their regular Wednesday youth meeting. They had church in there. Holy Spirit was moving. They brought the fire back from that youth conference back to church here. Not only that, but had... Um, one young man, I, his, his parents showed me the text last Sunday. So I was sitting there in the service while we were worshiping. They showed me the text message. Look, he sent me this last night. He said, Mom, Dad, I, I think I got saved 
tonight. He said, because my whole body feels like a bowl of ramen noodles and I don't want to do anything wrong ever again. That's the generation that everybody tells you is a degenerate generation. That's not all true. And another young man, same, same youth conference, his mom had uh, posted this, and this young man had had, I guess, lifting weights years ago and injured his hip somehow and was no longer able to bend all the way over, had to sit down to put his shoes on as a teenager. That's just not really, uh, you know, a very common thing. But God healed him at that youth conference. She's got pictures of him. She said, to you, it might not be a big deal, but to see my son be able to bend over and touch the floor is a miracle of God. And then one last testimony for this week. The brother in our church just got me choked up a little bit. He comes to me, he's a pastor. He said, I want to just tell you how good God is. And he started trying to tell me. He began to get choked up and cry, and that choked me up. He said, I put my brother's name on the list last year. He said, every time I try and reach out to him and tell him about God, he's belligerent. Oftentimes he'll cuss me. He said, usually it just ends up in an argument. He said, I get so mad. He said, so this year we did the prayer and fasting. I didn't even fill one of those out because I thought, what's the use? He said, but, but I'd still send him text messages of scriptures because at least then I don't have to hear from him. He said, but he called me the other day. And here on the other end of the line, he was crying. He said, I want to thank you for sending me those texts. And I don't remember if it was a friend of his that had died or was sick to the point of death, but that was part of what got him thinking. But I'm just telling you, God had planted a seed. He said, I thank you for sending me those texts. And he said, I want you to tell me some more about God. And he said, on the other end of that phone, I could hear him crying. He said, Pastor, God's real. I want to tell you this morning that God is absolutely real. God is still on the throne. God's still in the saving business. He's still in the healing business. I know what it's like sometimes that you, you put a petition out to God and you pray over it and it doesn't seem like God is doing anything or maybe your prayers just aren't being answered, but don't give up. That's a tool of the enemy. Discouragement is a tool of the enemy. You do remember that story of Lazarus who was dead four days. I mean, it's over. When, when you're dead one day, it's, that's over. Two days just doubles it. By the time we're at four days, it's a done deal. But God. I'm telling you this morning, it doesn't matter what you're facing, how, how final it is. I'm telling you that God is still on the throne. But, but God is still able. Lord, we just welcome you into this place today. I want to get right into the Word. I want to talk to you on Palm Sunday this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew 21. I'm not usually a, a thematic preacher. I preach what God's got on my heart. This morning, though, I do want to preach this being Palm Sunday that God had had this. I thought I would preach something else, but I wasn't really planning to. I, I've just had this thing echoing in my heart for over a week now. And, and finally, the Holy Spirit had me go back and relook at something that it's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Matthew chapter 21, begin with verse 10. After we get through this text, we're going to flip over to Luke. This account of Palm Sunday is recorded in all four Gospels, but I want to look at these two accounts today. But Matthew 21, verse 10. When he was come to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? It's amazing to me that people can know of Jesus and still not know about him. And there may be people in your life, in your neighborhood, that would surprise you, the fact that they don't really know anything about Jesus. They know the name, but they don't know anything about him. I'm going to share just a little testimony. Pastor Warren preached last week. He's been helping me out, doing a little bit of counseling and stuff, and, and I appreciate that. He, he's been a tremendous blessing to this body and to the pastor. But there was a, a gentleman that he counseled with, a couple weeks back, and the Holy Spirit led him to just ask him about 
to salvation. Be careful because I don't I don't want you to think we, we make illustrations of what God's counseling, but he began to ask this young man if he even understood what Easter was all about. This young man had grown up in the church, attends another church, comes here sometimes. He had no idea what Easter meant, had no idea what Easter was about, had no idea what Christmas was all about. I'm sharing that testimony because I want you to understand there may be people all around you who who know the name Jesus, but they have no idea what that name means. And we take for granted, this is the reason oftentimes I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a word guy. I like the words on the screen. I, I don't want to skip context. I, I probably, arguably, read too much text sometimes. Because I don't like to assume that you know something. I, I don't want to assume that somebody you brought to church with you that day knows about David and Goliath. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. All this just to tell you this morning, there are people all around us today that need to know the name Jesus Christ, and more than just His name. They, they need to know Him in the fullness of His glory, that, that this God is a living God, able to change and transform your life, able to take and sober up an addict, able to restore a marriage, able to heal the sick, able to give life and hope in a future. That, that's not just a word that you share, it's something that you live. Yes, Hallelujah. So when he was come to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple. Say, into the temple. He went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but you've made it into a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple. Say, in the temple. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. And when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did. Look at that word, wonderful. They saw the wonderful things that he did and heard the children crying in the temple saying, Hosanna, the son of David. They were sore displeased. They saw the awesome power of God and yet they were displeased. I want to I deal with something this morning. Uh, a spirit of religion even in the church. This is what God had me. This is, this is Palm Sunday. And, and, and God was setting the stage. God was setting the stage here for, for the greatest victory that mankind has to date ever known. That, that would be next week, Sunday. That, that would be what happened at the cross. God was setting the stage on Palm Sunday for the greatest victory the world would ever know. And, and the first order of business, God goes to the temple and he starts running people out of church. I'm visual, so I, I, I thought about it this morning. I said, I wonder, I wonder what my Monday would look like if I came in today and I just started running people out of the church. Not everybody, but, but let me be real. There's some people, you've been coming to church for so long, but you're not interested in hearing what God has to say. It's just the duty that you do every week. And God's not looking for, for, for three more people or one more person to come and sit in a church somewhere. God's looking for people that will be sold out. God's looking for people that will so radically fall in love with Him that they will let the light of Jesus Christ be seen through them. That we would unashamedly tell somebody about Jesus. It's, it's a bunch of hogwash that we say, well, I don't know what to say. You, you'll tell anybody about a good deal. You, you don't have to know. You don't have to know everything about cars to know if there's a good deal. If, if the Ford dealership selling new pickups for five bucks. All I know is that's a good deal and I don't want you to miss out. I found the best deal of the universe. Jesus Christ. And it's for whosoever. God's calling, as I, as I looked at this, the first order of business was God came to the temple. The word of God says judgment begins with the house of the Lord. As the Holy Spirit began to show me, look, Palm Sunday, I was setting the stage for, 
for one of the greatest victories that man has ever known. And, and what God was doing was God was trying to move all the boundaries, all the barriers to the miracles out of the way. If I read for you the end, once he got rid of those that said the lame and the blind, they came to him in the temple and he healed them there. I believe that God's got me this morning bringing a message, dealing with the spirit of religion versus relationship. And what God brought back to my mind is, is over these last couple of months, God's been calling the church to reposition themselves, to line up with him. De dealing with the spirit of religion and going through the motions, it's more than that. Line up with me and with my word. And see if I won't do the things that I've promised to you. See if I'm not faithful to my word. Line up with me. If I can get the spirit of religion out of the way, I can move every barrier, every obstacle to the miracles. Because you realize, listen, God didn't need to move them inside the church to heal anybody. You do know that, right? He could have healed them on the streets. He had done it before. But the, the reality is, what was going to happen on Easter Sunday, the resurrection, was going to be the conception of the church the church would then formally be birthed in acts chapter 2 at pentecost and what he was doing he was establishing the church and, and what he was doing before he would birth that he wanted to clean house and make sure that when i birth this that you understand this is the vehicle that god has chosen designed created to be the house of prayer, the house of miracles, the place of no barriers. If there's a place that we ought to come in expecting that God's going to do something, it ought to be the house of God. But unfortunately, we've gotten so commonplace with God that we come in casually. We don't even come in with the spirit of worship. We wait for somebody to pump us up. God said, if I could ever just get religion out of the way. If I could get people just to fall in love with me for who I am and come to me because of who I am and not because of what songs they've got or what the preacher sounds like or what the programs they have. Ha oh, come on, somebody. This was God lining the church up, removing the barrier so that when he established only the church that this would be the place of his dwelling, the place of his power. And you know the church isn't the four walls. You do realize that. On this particular Palm Sunday, the Jews found themselves under heavy oppression, heavy taxes, persecuted by the Romans, despised. Uh, crucifixions and other forms of punishment were, uh, were, were very commonplace. Of course, Jesus realizes all of this stuff. Just like he knows everything that you're facing today. I want you to understand this morning, God knows the problems that exist in our culture. God knows the problems and the situations and the storms that you're facing in your life. He knew all of these things. And, and yet, he showed up and he went to church to deal with the spirit of religion first. If I can deal with that first, all these other things will fall into their place. Here we have the Jews of that day. They are so heavily oppressed by the Romans that they are looking for, longing for, anticipating. They've preached it for years that there's coming a Messiah. That one day God's going to deliver us. I'm, I'm tired of living this way. God, I, I need somebody to deliver me from my problem. I need somebody to help me get through this. I, I need something, God, to relieve the pressure. Lord, I'm, I'm looking for a breakthrough. This is where the Jews were. They were looking for a breakthrough. And, and they had seen, by this point, they had seen the miracles of Jesus. They, they had seen the blind eyes open. They had seen the, the, the lepers who were now healed. They had seen the dead Lazarus. The Bible, if you'd read a little bit more, you'd find out that many of those in the crowd, that they were there because they had heard and seen what God had done in Lazarus, who was dead four days but now was very much alive. No doubt, many in the crowd that day were probably part of the group that, that was there when Jesus fed them with just a few loaves and a few fish. So here they are, they're looking for an answer to the world's problems, looking for a solution to their own problems, looking for a way of escape, looking for somebody to deliver them. And if there's anybody, it must be this man, Jesus. They're excited because Jesus shows up and it's just the right time because here they're anticipating, they're approaching Passover. And for a Jew, they celebrated Passover, what God had done, how he brought them out of Egypt, out of bondage there. 
And they would celebrate that every year as a memorial of what God had done in the past, but also as a, as a hope of the future, looking forward to the day that God would again deliver His people, that God would someday again deliver them from whatever oppression, whatever bondage, whatever problems, whatever things that they were going through. So they were looking forward to it, and Jesus shows up. And the crowd goes wild. Let me read this for you in, in Luke chapter 19, verse 29. So here we see this crowd. They are excited, but they are, they are eager for revolt. Verse 29, it says, And it came to pass, when he was come nigh to Bethpage and Bethany, at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, into which, which you are entering, you shall find a colt tied. Whereon yet never sat a man, nobody's ever ridden him, loose him, and bring him here. And if any man asks you, why do you loose him, thus shall you say unto him, because the Lord has need of him. And they went, and they that were sent went their way and found, just like he told them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners therefore came and said to them, why are you loosing the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. And so they brought him to Jesus. They cast their garments on the colt, and then they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way on the road. And as he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works which they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some, some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said to him, Master, Rebuke thy disciples. He answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Let me stop here for a moment. Let me just say this. This has always been one of those very convicting scriptures for me personally. I, I don't want a dumb rock, an inanimate rock. I believe it literally. I don't want a rock to ever sing the praises that, that I owe to God. I don't want a rock to ever have to give God the glory for what He's done in my life. If, if I ever cease to praise God, God says, I'll cause a rock because even as dumb as that rock is, it recognizes the Creator. It doesn't matter what you're going through, how many people step on you. You know what they do with rocks? They crush them down into nothing. They, they make sand out of them. They make gravel for your driveway. They put it on the road. It's to be trampled on and walked on all of its life. That's its whole purpose and yet the rocks will praise God no matter what kind of hell they've been through. Oh, that'll preach better than your amen in this morning. Some of you today, you got to learn to give God praise no matter what storm you're going through, no matter what valley you're in, no matter how many people have run over you or walked over you or how low you may feel or how broken you may feel. God's got a plan and God's got a purpose for your life. Amen. And I'm going to give God praise through it all. He said, I tell you the truth, if they hold their peace, the rocks would immediately cry out. And when he was come near, he beheld, he stopped, he looked over the city, and he wept over that city. Saying, if you had only known, if you had only recognized, even you had, at least in this day, your day, the things which belong unto your peace, but now they're hid from thine eyes. For all the days shall come upon thee, that thy enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round about, keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because you knew not the time of your visitation. Because you, you didn't recognize God when he showed up to deliver you. You got so focused on your problem, you didn't see the... Solution, solution in Jesus. Here we are. This is the scripture of Palm Sunday or, or as the heading on your Bible may say the triumphant entry or the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ. Jesus was coming. How many of you know he's coming? Jesus was coming but before he would show up Scripture had to be fulfilled. In Zechariah 9, verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Some 500 years or so before Jesus was even born, Zechariah had foretold. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king comes unto thee. 
and he is just and having salvation lowly and riding on an ass and upon a colt, the fowl of an ass. So the Lord was coming, but before he would come, the word of God had to be fulfilled. Are you with me this morning? You declare you know he's coming back. I want you to know today the word of God is being fulfilled right in front of our faces. And many of us today, while we say we know he's coming back, we wouldn't recognize him if he showed up. I know that people have said, well, I heard my grandmother say that, and her grandmother said that, and Pastor, I've heard it all my life. God's coming back. Well, I want to tell you, dear friend, the reality is that the things that I'm preaching to you that have come to pass, my own father couldn't have said it at my age. He could not have told you that these things had happened at that point. Yes, he had heard it, but I'm telling you now things are coming to pass. Before he would come, the scripture had to be revealed. Before he came, the Bible said the first thing that he did, he sent his disciples to go and loose the coat. You, you say that you know he's coming back, but before he shows up, this, listen, before he showed up, the word of God was fulfilled. Before he showed up, he already sent the disciples out. He's coming back, and the word of God is being fulfilled. Anybody heard of the Great Commission? Go ye therefore. The words that he said to his disciples about this donkey, go ye therefore. Go into the village. He didn't tell you and me to go into the village. He said go into the world. Don't stop with just your neighborhood. Go into the world. And there you'll find a donkey that's tied up. That donkey is symbolic of a burden to be, symbolic of a man. There you'll find, if you'll go out into the world, if you'll just be my disciples, go out into the world. The world is full of people who are tied up and tied down. Jesus said, I have come to set the captive free, to loose them. If anybody asks you why they ought to come to church with you, tell them because the Lord has need of them. He's trying to get the church in order. He's setting the stage for the greatest victory, but I'm telling you the greatest victory is still yet to come. Heaven awaits you and I because of what happened at Calvary's Hill, but He is coming back. And the scripture's already playing out right in front of our face. And these group, these, this group of people, they were looking for, anticipating. They had preached it. They had heard it. They had talked about it. he was coming back. And yet, even when they saw the scripture being fulfilled, somehow they didn't recognize. Oh, they, they said all the right church things. Yes, they, they said, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Oh, glory. How they knew all the church words. But they didn't recognize him. Come on. There's so many in the church today, man, we can, we can worship with the best of them. We can jump and clap and shout. He's dealing with this spirit of religion first, trying to get everybody lined back up. Just, just have a heart for God. He sends them out, says the world is full he said, it's never been rid. You understand what that? It's not broken. It's not a broken animal. And, and I don't mean broken in the bad context. It's like a wild stallion. If it's not broken, it's never, it's, it's never been ridden. It's wild. The world is full of people. And some of them may be good people. You, you may have people that live next door to you and they give you the shirt off your, their, their back. They'll come over and cut your grass. Anytime you're not home, they'll watch your dog. They'll, they'll do anything for you. And they're not bad people. But they're tied down on their job, tied down, and all that's doing is keeping them away from Jesus Christ. And they say, why, why would I want to go to church with you? Because the Lord has need of you. He said, well, God wouldn't want me. Listen, I know that feeling. Some of you may not feel that way, but that's how I still feel. God, you wouldn't want me. I'm still in awe. I don't understand why God chose me, but he did. God didn't need that donkey. He could have called for a horse. But for the scripture to be fulfilled, he called for that donkey. God chose that donkey. God chose this donkey. God chose this man. God chose you. Your name may say, God wouldn't want me. Oh, but he chose you. He does want you. He does love you. He loves you with a love that you cannot even copy. And I, I cannot fathom the love of a God who would send his son to hang on that cross at Calvary's Hill for me. I cannot comprehend, I cannot wrap my mind around a God that would love me when I was strung out, that would love me when I didn't want anything to do with Him who passionately pursued me. You understand what I mean when I say that? I didn't want anything to do with God. I wanted heaven. I've always wanted heaven. I didn't want God for a season in my life because God brought conviction. 
Because when the Holy Spirit showed up, it made me uneasy to be doing the things that I was doing. I didn't want that feeling. I wanted heaven, but I didn't want that conviction. And so I pushed God away as far as I could keep him away. But God passionately pursued me. I'm telling you, there'd be times where I'd be high as a kite in the Holy Spirit. I didn't know what conviction was. The Holy Spirit come in and I've got to leave. Tell my buddies, you riding with me, we got to go. You can stay or you can go, but I'm going. I don't even know what's going on. I throw dope away. I dump alcohol out. I, I got a clean house. And tomorrow I might be right back in that same mess. Oh, but he passionately pursued me. And I don't understand why God loved me when I was unlovable. You understand God loves you. No matter how unlovable you think you are, no matter what you've done, God's not interested in that. No, He's interested in His Son. His Son chose you. He died for you. If this is a message that you even remotely believe, then you ought to tell somebody. He sent me to set the captive free. I'm just doing the Lord's work. He told me to come to you and to loose you and bring you to him. Do you understand what this, what this donkey would be used for? He would usher in the presence of God. God would use this, don this unlikely candidate. He's not strong enough. He's not qualified. He's not proven. He doesn't have credentials. But God used him. God chose him. And he placed his son on that vessel. And that vessel ushered in the presence of God. You see, God can take an old drunk and use him to preach the gospel and usher in the presence of God to hundreds. God, God can take an old convict, save him, sanctify him, fill him with the Holy Ghost and send him back to prison on the other side of the bars to lead multitudes to usher in the presence of God. You have people that say, why would God want me? I'm just telling you, the Lord has need of you. Listen. But we as the disciples, we have to just be obedient first and go. It's a religious spirit where we just come. God never called us to come. God called us to go. We, we've, gotten, we've gotten this whole thing twisted where, where we come to church. You are the church. Be the church. Be the church implies that you go. No, let, me, let me say this. I don't want you to get it twisted. Come next week. Y'all going to be done laying home next Sunday. So Pastor Mark said, go. So I went and stayed. He said, go get them, loose them, bring them to me. Some folks never come because you don't ask. Some folks never come because the one time you finally got up the courage to ask and they said, yeah, you said, oh, I won't be there this Sunday. And we chuckle, but I couldn't tell you how many times that I've met somebody at the doors of this church introduced myself and I said yeah, I'm here my friend so and so is here are they here yet uh, uh, I haven't seen them yet maybe they'll be here in a minute and that's not just since we've been a big church see sometimes you're the only Jesus people know you're the only one they see you told me how good God is I thought well Maybe I'll check into this God. And then I showed up and realized you didn't even think he was all that. I'm going to stop meddling if you'll stop. Amen. He goes straight to the church, straight to the temple. He starts cleaning house. Starts aligning them so that all the barriers, the obstacles... That are in the way for the miracles of God can be removed so we can get back to the heart of worship. Get, get back to pure and undefiled worship. Where it's all about God. 
in this group of people that are praising him or people that have been touched and impacted by, by the ministry of Jesus Christ, whether they were part of the crowd there that he fed, maybe the lepers. I, I, I'm, I'm certain that there were people in the crowd that had individually and personally been healed and touched by Jesus. There's no doubt in my mind. I know the reality is that there were many in the crowd who had heard of the miracles. The whole point is this, that every one of them there that day had been impacted by this man Jesus Christ in some way. And that's the reason that they've come to give praise and the glory and honor to him. And yet there were some in the crowd, in verse 39 it says, And some from among the multitude said to him, Master, rebuke your disciples. This is interesting because they, they call him Master. But they want to silence the praise. They, they call him master, but they, they don't really want him to be in charge. They call him master, but they don't want to give over control to him. What he's doing is still this, this religious spirit. I praise God our church isn't like this, but there are churches today that, that they, they would tell you on the program what time they're going to start and what time you'll get out. I can't for the life of me figure out how you can do that. Not if God's in control. If the Holy Spirit's going to have His way, then, then that means I won't be able to have mine. And that might mean you won't be able to have yours. Sometimes we, we miss out on the blessings of God because this religious spirit where we, we've got it boxed in to this time, to this time. And, and sometimes, listen, it's not always orchestrated on this side of the pulpit. Sometimes it's on the pews. Where we come into church and we say, well, I, I've got somewhere to be at such and such a time. And you're welcome. We don't, we don't lock the doors. You can go. But understand this. When you come into the house of God, there's nothing wrong with having plans. Let me say this. There's nothing wrong with having plans. But it's a matter of prioritizing them. When you come here, you, say, you, you draw a hard line and say, God, you know I got somewhere to be at 1230. What you just told God is, God, if, if, if you want to visit with me today, you better come meet me first. Because I got to go. Well, Pastor, I don't mean that. Well, that's what you do mean. When you box God in and you say, God, here's the parameters in which you can bless me. I'm coming today. God, you know I've done my part. God, it's your job to do yours. On the day of Pentecost, they had been in that upper room for 10 days. This is going to sting a little bit. We can hardly get people to come and pray for 10 minutes. Everybody wants to be there when the power of God falls. Everybody wants to be there when the blessings come down. But very few are willing to pay the price. God's dealing with the spirit of religion here. This is what I'm preaching this morning. I believe that God's up to something. I, I don't believe this is anything new. I don't believe this is even a, a prophetic word for two. I believe God's always been up to something. I believe there's so much more that God wants to do in your life. I am 100% convinced of that. I am 100% convinced that this church is nowhere near meeting God's potential. And I don't mean that negatively. I just mean that as a matter of fact. I believe that God wants to do so much more in your life that, that, will, that will explode. You want to talk about revival. I believe if we would just let God have His way in our life as an individual, revival would happen. But it's a religious spirit. We come in our Sunday morning, we, we, we know how to do the programs, and we do them well. Some from among the multitude said, Master, they call him Master, but they don't want to submit to him. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, do not the things which I command? Some of you, you've been in church so long, and you call him Master, but you don't submit to his word. I can preach till I'm blue in the face, but it doesn't do anything. You, you, you're, you're determined you're going to live your life the way you want it. You want God to just come in and bless whatever other area. And I'm not here to beat you up or to beat you down. I'm here to set you free. What Jesus is trying to do is deal with that spirit of religion. Remove all the obstacles, all the barriers, so that you can see the living God for who he is. The miracle worker, the way maker, the healer. That's who you are. We just sang that. Jesus gets ready to ride into Jerusalem. The crowds go wild. It's, uh, I'm visual. I think about it probably like a, a rock concert. Everybody's pumped up because they heard he's in town. But then when they see him, you know, everybody goes wild. Jesus shows up and everybody goes crazy. 
They start saying, Hosanna. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. They start taking their coats off and throwing them on the road. Paving the way for that donkey to trample on their garments. Basically saying, I'm nothing, you're everything. You can call them Lord, but if you really want surrender, if you really want submit, it's two different things. They, they begin to wave palm branches. And as loud as the crowd is getting, the, the reason is because they've seen the miracles, they've heard of what he's done, because their lives have been impacted. But all of a sudden, all of a sudden the noise dies down as they see Jesus do something. Jesus comes, he approaches the city, and everybody's going crazy, everybody's excited, because finally deliverance is this whole thing. We can taste it. God's about to do something wonderful. But then he stops, and he looks over the city, and he begins to weep. And it begins to speak of the destruction of Jerusalem. All of a sudden, it becomes very apparent. You, you're not going to do what I want you to do, are you? you? You didn't come. See, I wanted you to fix my problem. My problem is the Romans. It, my problem is that God, my situation is this. It, it's becoming apparent that you're not going to do what I thought you were going to do. Let me meddle a moment. This is what we do in our prayer. And the devil uses this to frustrate you and pull you away from God. They're willing to sing this prayer, and it will matter in the next scene. It's amazing to me how finicky the mind and the heart really is. Oh, we'll praise God as long as he's obliging us. As long as he's doing whatever we need in that moment. As long as everything's good. Oh, hallelujah. Jose, save now. Oh, blessed is God. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. God is good. But then when it becomes apparent that God's not going to move on your time frame, when, when it shows up like Mary Martha and your brother's dead, but God could have showed up, but he didn't show up. And they weren't singing God's praises then. They weren't shouting Hosanna then. When, when you go to the doctor and you, you put it on the altar and you've been praying, you've been fasting, and you got all pumped up because Pastor Mark preached something and it stirred your spirit and you were like them on the day of, of Palm Sunday. Glory, hallelujah, hosanna to God of the highest. God's going to do something. But other people are getting their miracles and you're still in a holding pattern. It doesn't feel like anything. Say, God, I'm, I'm waiting for you to fix my problems, God, but you're not. And we start looking for another route. Our praise goes silent. Our prayers change. Hear me this morning. When your faith begins to roll away, your praise begins to diminish. Your faith begins to dwindle. Your prayers begin to dwindle and die. And we start getting creative trying to find another solution. Here's why it matters. And the next thing, it'll be these same people who are crying, Hosanna. They'll be crying, crucify him. Wait a minute. Now, now, now if, if you still believe that he's your hope, you're going to need him. But if you get to the point where you're convinced that he can't do anything for your problem, you'll start trying to find another solution. I don't need you anyway, God. And you can come to church, believe it or not, people come to church sometimes and still have that same attitude. They're praying for God to send them a mate, but they don't want to wait for God to send them a mate. They want to find their own. They'll justify the sin they're living in and then ask God to bless the mess. Oh, I believe God sent me this for pastor, and then why are you living in sin? If God said he sent you one to be a helpmate, this was only doing pulling you away. We say that we, we believe God, he's, he's our master, but then we won't even tithe because you don't trust God. Well, no, I do trust you. I just can't afford you. You don't trust him. Call it what it is. Let's deal with the spirit of religion. You're trying to figure out why you're not getting blessed. It's because you just have a religious spirit. We say, master. We say, master, but then we silence his praise by the way that we live. He's breaking that religious spirit. He shows up on this the triumphal entry. And the reason he pauses and he weeps, he said, if only you had recognized, if you had recognized the deliverance, if you had recognized the moment of your deliverance, but you didn't, you were so focused on your problem, you couldn't even see the deliverer standing there. Sometimes you get so bogged down on your problem, you can't praise God because you're so consumed with the reality that your problem isn't going away and God doesn't seem to be doing anything about it and you even begin to dream in your mind maybe he doesn't even care about it maybe he doesn't even care about you 
You say, God, I don't have any peace. Only if you would fix this and I have peace. But do you realize what they missed is the reality is the peace was with them. You remember what Jesus said? He said, in this world you'll have trials and tribulations. You're going to have trouble. You're going to go through things. He said, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I've told you these things that in me, this is what he said, that in me you might have peace. You understand what that looks like? You, you might be going through the worst storm of your life, but in Jesus is where your peace is. Some of us, we think the peace is when we get out of the storm. And the reason we won't praise God is because we're not out yet. I'm, I'm telling you the truth. That if you don't praise him, the rocks will cry out. Do you realize the word of God says that he inhabits the praises of his people? I am convinced that many of us never get our breakthrough because of the moment that we begin to focus on our problem, our praise diminishes. When our praise diminishes, our faith follows. When our praise diminishes, not only does our faith follow, but our testimony follows. Our hope begins to follow that. Everything begins to wilt. Everything begins to wither. Everything begins to die. Because... Even, Even if he doesn't move like, like you want him to, and in the next scene, if you still believe that he's God, the last thing you want to do is write him off. The last thing you want to do is get rid of him. The last, last thing you want to do is say, crucify him. No, I need him. The rest of you may not need him. The rest of you may think you can live without him, but I can't live without him. Even if my problems are still looking me in the face, I can't live without him. I can't make it without him. I'm going to wrap this thing up, but I want you to know this point. He said, see, I wonder how many times he, he looks over his church on a given, given Sunday, Sunday and he weeps because we had a good religious spirit, but we didn't get it. How many times we sat there on our pew and the altar was over. So, man, that's good. That man, that's good. That, that really got me. Preacher, that got me good. Who cares? God, God didn't come. To get you. God didn't come to make you feel better. God came to set you free. He's come to change your life. I'm telling you. That even, even in the valley. If you, if you get rid of that religious spirit. You'll be like David. Yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow. That I'll fear no evil for you're with me. Yes I'm still in the middle of my problem. I can't even see daylight at the end of the tunnel. But I'm not afraid God because you're with me. You, you are my peace. You are the answer to my problem, God. I'm, I'm not looking for a way around it. Listen, if you ever realize the depth of God's love, it hit me this morning. I'm closed. Let me get my musicians to come. If you understood the depth of God's love, you would understand you can trust Him through anything. When I was a child, I, I got whipped. <laughs> and I deserved it. I, I didn't get some of them that I did deserve. I got away with some stuff. But you know what? Even in spite of that, I, I knew that my mama loved me and I knew that my daddy loved me. And, and I would endure anything. I wasn't looking to run away. I wasn't trying to get out of it. I wasn't trying to bypass it. it if they wanted to move somewhere, I would go. I trusted them even if I didn't understand there were a lot of things that happened as a child. I look back now, I didn't understand then. I just had questions, but I, I didn't, didn't really question it. I had questions, but I didn't question I went along with it. What I'm telling you is that when you realize how much somebody loves you, you'll go with them through almost anything. You can endure almost anything as long as you know that you've gotten. Some of you feel that way about your spouse. Praise God for that gift. But I want you to know you can feel that way about God. You can be like David. My, my problems haven't changed. The Romans aren't going to be dethroned. It's apparent. But you're not going to leave me, are you, God? No, I've already promised you I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Well, then I can go ahead and praise you now. Go ahead and stand with me this morning. Why don't we go ahead and give God a praise now? Go ahead and begin to praise Him this morning. Whatever God has promised you, I want you to know that God's a big enough God to see it through. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Here's what I want you to understand this morning. God has sent me here with a message of deliverance. That some of you, you don't realize your breakthrough. Your breakthrough is an alignment issue. Your breakthrough is an alignment issue. And you've settled in for a religious spirit and God's coming directly to the church. The triumph and entry in the first place he goes was to the church to clean house. 
to break that religious spirit. I'm not interested in your religion. I'm interested in your heart. If you just fall in love with him because of who he is. You would realize you can go with him through anything. As long as you've got Jesus, you can endure anything. You can go through sickness with a smile on your face because you've got joy in your spirit saying, I know that God's with me. I don't want to complain. I don't want to grumble. I don't want to be discouraged and defeated. I feel that way in my flesh, but I know better in my spirit. These altars are open this morning. If you're here today and you need prayer, I want you to come. If you're here today and you need a break, I want you to come. Find you a spot and worship God. Lord, I refuse. I refuse to withhold my praise one more moment. Not another day, God. Not one more moment. I've been called up into the spirit of discouragement, frustration, because things haven't moved like I wanted them to. But I trust you. Won't you come? Find you a spot and worship with us this morning. I believe today that God is setting the stage even now to remove hindrances and obstacles, to remove the barriers to your blessings even today. I'm expecting God for great things even in this next week and the upcoming weeks. I'm believing God for the things that He's promised to you. I'm believing God for miracles, for signs, for wonders. I'm believing God for testimonies, not for my glory, not for the church's glory, but for the glory of God. God's looking for people who just have a heart for Him. All over this house, worship with us. If you need prayer this morning, I want you to come. If you feel like there's problems and battles that you've been facing and fighting that there doesn't seem to be any hope for, I want you to come. Rebuke that in me today in the name of Jesus Christ. All over the house, worship with us.
Father, we give you praise, Lord. Surely you have, you have met us in this place. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that the strongholds of religion, person, individual, God, that they not only be confronted to say, but they be broken for your glory. Lord, break our heart with a holy and righteous love for you. Lord, break our heart, God, just to long for you, to long for your presence, God. Lord, that we would praise you, that we would be faithful, God, no matter what we're facing, no matter what we're going through, God. May, may we be a people who know that we were created and called into your own image. That we, we were your cherished love as you hung that cross that it was me you were thinking of. That I might know the depth of my Father's love that I might endure and I might say, of course, I'd be found faithful that I would praise you even in the storm, even through the valley. Lord, I give you praise. I give you glory. Set the captive free according to your word today. Lord, as we go forth this day, I pray in Jesus' name that the souls, Lord, that you put in our mind and on our heart, those to reach out to that you begin to prepare their heart, Lord, and I'm believing you for greater things to come. I'm believing you for miracles. I'm believing you for testimonies. I'm believing you for souls, salvations, God, for your glory. Lord, as we depart from this place today, may we do so in the peace and the power of your holy name. I want to tell you, church, this morning, I'm not going to dismiss. I, I think about this. I, I don't want to dismiss you. I want to send you. He said, Behold, I send you. When we leave this place, we're not to, to leave as though we are dismissed. No, we, we leave as ones that have been sent. You have a mission, amen? Would you give the Lord a praise clap this morning? Agree with me this week in prayer. Let's believe God for souls. As you begin to pray, you begin to invite. Bring somebody with you. You got two arms. You ought to have one on each side at least. God bless you. I'll see you Wednesday. <laughs>